as we move into this time for the sermon, uh, let's take a moment to quiet our hearts before God together. As we come from so many different places into this room today, so many distractions, so many things that can be pulling at our affections, let's take about 30 seconds or so simply to be quiet before God, and then I'll pray for us and we'll move into the sermon. So let's be quiet before God. Lord, we come to you now in prayer. Um, I've been reminded from Psalm 40, these great words of your servant David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned and turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet out on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. So, Lord God, as we come to you in prayer, we wait patiently for you. As much as we rushed through our weeks and even rushed here this morning, God, now I ask that you would still our hearts, that you would slow us down and open us up, God. Open up our hearts and minds to what you want to show us about yourself, about us, and about our relationship to you. Trusting, God, that you will... Lift us out of our slimy pits, out of the mud and mire, and that you will set us up on a rock. And that rock ultimately is the foundation of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we look to you and we look to him and we give ourselves to you at this time in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, right now, uh, it's, if you were to simply look at your phone and get a news update or or go online or get a newspaper or certainly, certainly turn on your TV, you'll see, that, you'll see that there's data breaches happening all the time, whether it's Equifax or if you go back over the months, you think about with Target and you think about with things such as Yahoo, that data is being compromised and identity theft is at an all-time high. If you look at some statistics from the Javelin Strategy and Research, they mention that right now identity theft is at an all-time high, that in 2016, an estimated 15.4 million consumers were hit with some kind of identity theft. This is up from 13.1 million in 2015, which translates to one in every 16 U.S. adults were victims of identity theft in 2016. Criminals are becoming more creative every single day with how to gain access to our information and then make a fake ID for us to steal our identity and to use that identity against us. We're well aware of the challenges that come with that. And, and with that, so with that, we need to be vigilant right, in terms of checking our accounts. Right? Sometimes our banks and, and the credit cards will help us with that. If there's a one-off purchase that seems out of line, they'll contact us. But it's really on us to stay vigilant, right, to protect our identity by checking our accounts, making sure that what's purchased is truly purchased by us. If, if there's extra accounts that have been formed, to shut them down and to go about those specific steps to protect our identity. Now, if that's the case with our financial identity and the accounts that we have, maybe you don't realize that just as much today, I believe that there's an all-time high that our identity in Christ, our identity that's found as children of God, as adopted, beloved children of God, is being compromised, is being attacked. And we as well need to take specific steps if we are to protect that identity that sense and knowledge of the fact that we are not only created in the image of God, but as followers of Christ have been adopted into his family forever, as his cherished adopted children, children that he loves unconditionally. But for many of us, we're pulled in so many different directions, and we look to our identity from so many different places that our identity could be, in essence, feels like our identity could be stolen from us and then used against us, and we can feel lost in a world where there's so much information, so much going on, and we need to protect our identity, and God gives us the ability to do that. That's our focus 
of today as we're concluding our sermon series on identity. If you've been with us the last, this is our fourth week in the series, we began in week one talking about how all of us are in some form of identity crisis. If you go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible, with Adam and Eve, and in that moment they were in a trusting, safe, and secure relationship with God, where they were known and they were together, they were naked and they were without shame, but once they disobeyed God and shame came into the picture, and then once they felt vulnerable, as you recall, they put together, they took fig leaves and they put together coverings and they hid from God, and in that they began into an identity crisis where they were hiding from God and hiding ultimately from each other. And we talked in that sermon about how God is the one who could restore that identity. And he promised to do so way back in Genesis 3 and the promise that in terms of sending Jesus. And for us, we need to also make ourselves available to it. I shared some of my personal story and how over the years, for me, I've lost my identity. My identity crisis has come from trying to hide behind perfectionism, achievement, and trying to prove myself to everybody all the time. I've had some good conversations with Many of you, some who struggle with the same thing, others who have different kinds of struggles, who are going through their own type of identity crisis where they realize, where is my identity truly found? Is it found in God? Is it found in his great love for us? Or is it found somewhere else? As we continued in the sermons a couple weeks ago, we talked about fake IDs, these different images that we put out to people, right? these images that could come in the form of perhaps relational relational IDs, or if maybe it's a relational image or career image or even body image. And last week we talked about how we could find false identity when we look to other people and we say we want to be just like them. And we try and find our identity by mimicking others as opposed to simply being the unique creation that God's created us to be, specifically in a relationship with him. And So today we complete the series by talking about identity protection. How do we protect this God-given identity that we have as a gift from him? Well, we have to review what is that identity? And to do that, we're going to go to the New Testament book of Galatians. And as you think about the Apostle Paul, an early church leader who was sent out all over the Mediterranean region, he started new church communities and then would send letters back to these church communities to teach them about the meaning and significance about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And in those letters, he would also include words of encouragement, words of challenge in terms of what it means to live a life worthy of the calling that they have as followers of Jesus. In the middle of these letters, he would include reminders of their identity in Christ. As we come to the letter of Galatians today, this letter was written to a series of churches in the region of Galatia. And they were facing an identity crisis as well, because though they received this good news of Jesus Christ, that God truly loved them, and God truly sent Jesus, and Jesus lived, and he died a death on a Roman cross, and three days later, in real time, was raised to life from the dead. And the promise of God was that they believed this to be true, not just in general, but true that God did this for them, that they would receive a new life in Christ, a new identity, as adopted children of God forever. They believed this good news, but shortly after Paul left, some teachers, false teachers, came in. And they came in with some ideas to call into question what Paul had said. In essence, the good news was too good to be true. And they said, there has to be more. In essence, they said, you need to adopt the old Jewish practices in order to be like the Jewish people, in order to be fully included in the family of God. And so Paul writes this letter, a passionate letter to these new Christians in the region of Galatia to let them know this is your identity. Don't forget your identity in Christ, that you are a beloved child of God. And that's not by your own efforts. It's a gift from God that he's given you. And so right in the middle of the letter in Galatians 2.20, arguably one of the best summaries of our identity in Christ, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, I've been crucified with Christ And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this dense verse of of Scripture, I mean, it is jam-packed full of, of grace and truth here. He's saying, I've been crucified with Christ, meaning as I've as I've put my faith in Christ, that my old life, my old way of life apart from God has died, has died with Christ, has been crucified. And that part no longer lives, but Christ now, he says, lives in me. 
this new life. And as, if you become a Christian, as you become a Christian, you're given this new life. You've been born from above or born again. And you receive the new life of Christ and a personal presence of God in the form of, his Holy, of the Holy Spirit. And he says, Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live. And then he says these wonderful words. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God, meaning as he trusts that God has done this for him, that God truly loved him, and God truly gave himself for him. That's where he finds this new identity. This new identity is a beloved child of God. And he reminds them of this right here in this jam-packed verse. But he knows that they've been taken by these false teachers, that those who've come in and said, you need to do extra works in order to earn God's favor. He moves on and in chapter 3, verses 1. This is the main focus of today's sermon. He writes this. Here's a wake-up call from Paul. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? See, this is God's word, and what Paul is saying, he's giving a wake-up call. I mean, he's not playing nice with the Galatians. He doesn't even call them brothers and sisters. Normally, he would say, brothers and sisters, you need to be thinking about this. He just comes out, guns blazing, you foolish Galatians. It'd be like me writing an email to the entire congregation, you foolish restoration people. Like, what is wrong with you? And he says, he says, you've been, he goes, you have, who has bewitched you? Right, this is strong language, bewitched. What is he talking about? It's like he's saying someone's put a spell on you. It's like you've been put into a trance. You're in a fog. And when he says foolish, another way to translate that would be to say, you crazy Galatians, you're insane, you've lost your mind. And why is Paul so passionate? Because all of Christianity hinges on what he's talking about here. Everything that Jesus did, that he came and he lived and he was among us. And he was crucified, and he was dead and buried, as we say in the creed. And three days later, he was raised to life from the dead, overcoming sin, overcoming evil, overcoming death itself. The great news of God that he came out of his great love for us to rescue us and to restore us. And Paul's passionate here. He says, you need to wake up because you're losing your identity. You're losing your identity in the fact that God did this for you. And you received this new life. You experienced his grace and his love and the freedom and the joy that comes from knowing you don't have to do everything in order to gain God's acceptance. He's done it for you. And Paul's saying, you need to wake up, you foolish Galatians. He's ultimately saying this in love, not to shame them. He's like, you're out of your mind. You need to refocus and remember your identity. Your identity that's ultimately found, not in what you can do, in his words, the works of the law, meaning by our own efforts or by the flesh. But by believing what you've heard, the only step that's necessary to receive all of the grace and the benefits and the joy and the freedom and the peace of Christ that's available to us in him is simply to trust and believe not only that God did this, but he did it for you and he did it for me to make it personal. And the good news of the Bible, the good news of Jesus Christ, if we believe that to have been done personally for us, we receive that new identity, that new life in Christ. And Paul here is saying, as you've received it, now protect it. Right, don't forget from where, how, how you got to this point. And he goes on, he asks a series of questions. So is it because of your efforts? Is it because of your works? Is that how you experience this wonderful joy and peace and freedom in God? No. It's like you received this by believing and trusting that God is not just out there, but that God came to be with us and that God loves us. And because he loves us, he did what he did. And he's offered this free gift as long as we receive it to us. So Paul's passionate about them remembering their identity. And I believe there's some patterns in here for us today as we seek to protect our God-given identity because there's so much that will pull us away from the truth 
the truth of Scripture, the truth of Jesus Christ, that we in him are loved and accepted unconditionally. Do you believe that to be true? Amen. Who's with me on this? Amen. If he truly loves you unconditionally, everything else on planet Earth is with conditions. Every relationship Everything you sign up for, everything has conditions. If you do X, then you'll get Y. The beauty of Christianity, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the beauty of the Bible is he says, all you have to do is accept what I've given to you, made, made available to you. It's been done. I love you unconditionally. Unconditionally. It really is amazing grace. We sang this song, This is Amazing Grace. I wonder if we truly could comprehend how amazing that grace is, that we would freak out. We would throw these chairs to the wall. We'd start dancing around. We'd bounce louder than Enter Sandman at Lane Stadium last night. I don't care what ABC shows. They'd bring cameras in here, and they would say, look at Restoration Church. They are bouncing. Exit Sandman, enter Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on. You can tell I'm from UVA. I'm sorry. i got to give a little Lane Stadium hit up. If you're watching this on camera and you're in Blacksburg last night and you're still there, we miss you. But guess what? It is so much more exciting, the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Flip this table. Come on. Someone's got to wake up in here. So God's saying, protect that amazing grace. Don't give in to anything else. There's so many things that are going to pull you away from that amazing grace. That identity that's found, that you're truly loved and accepted by God himself. The God who created you, who knows you by name. And so how do we protect this identity? First and foremost, we have to vigilantly, vigilantly remember that someone is trying to steal your identity in Christ. And this gets a little dangerous because this someone is real and it's someone that Jesus referenced multiple times. And this someone is the enemy of God. And this enemy is named Satan or the accuser or the devil. Now, Jesus describing him in John 8, 44, says that he's a murderer and he's the father of lies, meaning there's no truth in him, or he whispers lies to try and introduce doubts into, into our existence in terms of our understanding of God and our relationship with him. Later in John chapter 10, perhaps the, uh, the greatest uh, description, though not a great one to describe, he says, the thief has come only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus said, but I have come that they, meaning his sheep, would have life and have it to the full. The first part of John 10, 10 is the job description of God's enemy, Satan, or the devil. And his job description is simply to steal, kill, and destroy. And that comes in lots of different ways. One way it comes is he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy your sense of identity in Christ. The sense that you are loved and adopted forever and there's nothing you can do to earn or make that happen he wants to steal that from you he wants to kill that and he wants to destroy that sense that you are a beloved child of God and he'll do whatever it takes to try and rob you of the joy and the peace that comes from that truth and we have to get real with that as much as we can get real with trying to protect our financial identity in terms of checking our accounts or making sure we have all the protections in place, even more so with our spiritual lives and our identity in Christ, we need to vigilantly be aware that there is someone who's actively working against your experience of God's love and grace. That's no one to be scared of because the good news is that Jesus came and he died and he didn't stay in the grave. Three days later, he was raised to life overcoming all evil, including Satan himself. And so the good news of the Bible is that that war is already done. That ship has sailed. We still, there's still a struggle until Jesus comes back. But ultimately, the one who's in us, we read in 1 John, is greater than the one, him, who's in the world. So we have nothing to be scared of. But we have to be aware. He's trying to steal your sense of identity in God's love for you. And this comes in lots of ways. In my life, it's come oftentimes through guilt and shame. As I think about over my childhood and over the years of when I've turned against God and I've acted out in sin and I've done things that I wish I didn't do, that in my ways of trying to be perfect and my perfectionism and my achievement and trying to look perfect and look good to everyone, like these whispers come in. Not, audible, not an audible voice, but a thought that says, Jeff, you really thought you were that good, huh? Why would God love you? Look what you've done. 
Christian, pastor, yeah, whatever. And as I start beating myself up in the midst of that shame, evil gets a voice and calls into question my identity as a beloved child of God. You know, other times it's been when there's been some suffering or pain as I've experienced it. I've seen it in other people's lives when something that can't be explained happens, whether it's illness, the death of a loved one, things that in this broken world happen, and we don't know why they happen, but then that voice comes in and says, yeah, God, he's, he's really loving, huh? He let this happen in your life. Really? God's all powerful and, and this happened? You need to turn away from him. You can't trust him. It goes all the way back to the garden in Genesis 3 when the serpent said, did God really say? When Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness and said, if you are the son of God, the accuser is trying to accuse and, and to inject strategic poisonous ideas into our minds and our hearts that can steal our sense of identity as beloved children of God. We have to be aware of that and actively say, God, get those voices out of here because that's not the truth. You're the truth. So how do we do that? The second thing is we need to refocus on Jesus all the time and his completed work for us. Last week, we talked about three great words from 2 Timothy 2. Remember Jesus Christ. Right, and here, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 and verse 1, after he says, who's bewitched you? He says, before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. So in Galatians 3, 1, what he's saying is the message of Jesus Christ was clearly put out. Martin Luther in his lectures about Galatians says it's like a placard that has been placed out for everyone to see. And so when Paul brought this good news message about Jesus Christ, it was on full display that his death on the cross, his death as he was nailed to a cross, was done out of great love for you and for me. He's like, remember this work. Remember what he's done for you. Remember, because of that, you can be restored into this relationship with God and experience being a beloved child. So we have to refocus on Jesus. Lastly, this is where our role really comes in, is truly to commit, commit and to intentional reminders of God's grace every single day. Every single day. And this plays out both individually and together. And so individually, it means, at its best, it means simply recommitting to finding some quiet time with God, to be together with him. And what does that look like? It looks different for every single person. I've shared my experience really since before the summer, where I was challenged to simply take two minutes to be quiet with God, take out my phone and put a two-minute timer in and hit it and simply sit still, maybe prayer, a brief prayer like, here I am, Jesus. Jesus, here I am. And simply be quiet. I love being outdoors, so if it means looking up at the trees or hearing the birds chirp, it's a sense that God's there. Um, it's not like I have a, a chair next to me and I talk to the chair. I mean, it, but it's more, you're, just, you're quiet with God. And, you, and, and the beautiful thing is, when you're quiet with God like that, as I've, one person challenged me, he's like, when you're with someone that you love, you don't have to talk. You could simply be with them. It's a beautiful thing. I know with Laurie, sometimes our most intimate moments are just sitting together, not talking, not doing anything, just simply being together. It's oftentimes we don't know someone well, then we manically start talking and try and fill that quiet space. But when you're with someone that you truly love and you feel loved, you can simply be quiet. God invites you to that opportunity every single day. On our way down to the Presbyterian meeting, uh, one of our elders, Bridget Walker, was talking about how in the morning, that is her best time. And we talked about how it's so true that though some say, hey, I have to do it at night, I'm not a morning person, but in the morning, there's all that noise isn't there yet. Everything you've experienced, all the disappointments of the day aren't dragging you down. For most people, it's in the morning. To find some quiet time to simply be alone with Jesus. I know for me, it's on my front porch. I love just sitting on that chair and being quiet. And it's not just that quiet time. Then it's opening up scripture, whether it's in the Bible app or an old physical Bible or, um, and then maybe a devotion, whether our morning devotions. And this resource has been very helpful to me. It's called New Morning Mercies by Paul David Tripp. I love this devotion because it reminds me of God's grace every single day. 
when I want to start earning my way to God or beating myself up, this resource has been so huge. I love I met Paul David Tripp earlier this year, and he asked me this question. He goes, Jeff, he goes, who talks to you the most during the day? I'm like, mm -hmm. Little Laurie, my girls, maybe now my dog. Um, <laughs> who talks to me the most? And he's, he looked at me, he goes, you talk to you the most. He goes, the question is not what, not how much you're talking to yourself. What are you saying? And he knew he could probably tell. Maybe it's because I'm half Chinese. I beat myself up. But the fact that he's like, are you telling yourself good news or bad news? And this devotion has been an example, along with scripture, of being reminded every single day that not only God loves the world, that he sent his own and only son, but that God loves me, Jeff Lee. And he loves you. And so for us to protect our identity in Christ, we have to commit and recommit to having that alone time with God, being quiet, making ourselves available to his promises and his grace and his truth that's found in Scripture. And at points, consulting with others who have reflected on it as well, like our daily devotions or a devotion like this. I would say, too, on a weekly basis, it involves committing to being with God. And you've done it this morning. There's something that happens in a worship service. This is a time that's set apart by God, that he recalibrates our heart and realigns our heart, our heart and our mind to what's on his heart and mind. And something special happens here in the midst of songs, in the midst of the prayers, in the midst of the sermon and communion and giving of our offering and the benediction and simply being together. That we need this time to recalibrate our hearts. And let me tell you, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he will do everything in his power to keep you out of this room on Sunday morning. And don't let him lie to you and say, oh, it's just a worship service. I can do something else. Something happens here. And it's not because of me and what I'm preaching or what John's preaching or what Bill's preaching. It's not because of the music. It's because God is here, and he's invited you here, and the one who gave his life for you is here. And he wants to meet with you, not just individually, but together to encourage you and to remind you of his great love for you. And to reset your heart. It's like taking glasses and clearing them off so you can see clearly again and go off into the week. And so he wants you and I want you to make this a commitment. To be here on Sunday mornings. Right? To make this something which is pinned on your calendar and everything else falls into that. Not, not so much, well maybe if I can get to worship it'll work out. But if you truly believe that God loves you like he loves you and that you, it's so easy to lose track of that love every single day, let alone every single week, that at a minimum, to be here together, to be renewed in his promises, to be renewed in his love and his grace and his truth. My prayer for you is that you will make this the top priority and everything else comes after it, not the other way around. That's easy for me to say because I'm a pastor and I'm paid to be here, right? But even before that, right, growing up, I remember thinking, I want to go to church because God's grace is there. My prayer is that you would hunger and thirst for God's love and grace, that you would think, I can't miss a Sunday morning. I need to be here. And if you're not in town, find some place to worship. Find some place to worship. You know, as we read these great words in Hebrews finishing up about that, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, both encourages and challenges me along those lines. The writer says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And he says, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Right here, the day is talking about the day of judgment, the day when Jesus returns. And we don't know when that day is. We know the world's a crazy place. I'm not saying I don't know if it's coming anytime sooner. It does seem and feel like it's going to come sooner. So I think as you look at this passage, for me, it's almost no option that even more than ever, we need to be reminded of our identity in Christ. If you want to protect that identity, commit not only to meet with God alone, but recommit as well to be here together so he can give you a fresh infusion of his love, grace, and truth. So our finances and accounts, yeah, with those finances and accounts, identity theft's at an all-time high. I believe in our culture and the way things are that the theft of our identity in Christ is also at an all-time high. We need to be vigilant, we need to be committed, and we need to recommit to 
putting ourselves in a position where God can give us a fresh sense of who we are in him, our identity as beloved children of God. May God's love, grace, and truth permeate our lives as we recommit to finding his joy, his freedom, and his peace that comes in truly knowing that we are beloved children, unconditionally loved as children of God because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we finish up this time, I pray and ask God that you would have your way with us, that you would remind us, God, of your truth, the truth of who you are, the truth of your great love for us that came all the way from heaven to be with us, to die for the forgiveness of our sins. So God, I pray for each person in this room right now, God, as we come to this time of communion, as we reflect on your death and resurrection, that you would renew our sense of identity as your beloved children, loved by you unconditionally. May we taste and see that you are good through this time. Oh God, please help us to be vigilant and give us everything we need to protect that identity that you've given to us as a gift. We pray for all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, 